Hello, this is Steve from SDR Play. In today's video, we're going to talk about near field coupling. What is it, and is it of concern to you when it comes to using your RSP? Don't be the guy that makes the inside of your radio look like this. Some people read the caution on the inserts with their RSP and they wonder a little bit about what's going on. While they may understand that you don't want to connect a sensitive receiver to the same antenna as your transmitter, the question is, what is this near field and does it apply to me? When a receive antenna is installed very close to a transmitting antenna, additional coupling effects take place, both non-radiative or reactive and radiative or Fresnel coupling. This results in considerably more energy being coupled into the receive antenna and in extreme cases it may even cause damage to the receiver. I'm showing a link here for a wiki for further information and I will include that in the YouTube description. Some people ask if this is a new concern and it's not. It's always been necessary to protect sensitive receiver inputs from exceedingly high input signals. However, it's come to the forefront with the advent of SDRs because SDRs tend to be sensitive receivers which are used in close proximity to those high-powered transmitters. For many years, my interest revolved around shortwave listening only. So, although I had a variety of different receivers, I never had a nearby transmitter to be of any concern. And then, of course, there were also the hams that were transmitting as well as receiving. So while their rig does indeed have a sensitive receiver internally, there is a TR switch which isolates the receive circuitry from the high-powered transmit signals going out to the antenna. Of course, it's not unheard of for a ham to have more than one radio in the shack. And indeed, if you have a, a receive-only device in your shack, you do need to make sure that it's well protected when you're using your transceiver. Which brings us to SDRs, and here we most definitely have the case of a sensitive receiver being operated in close proximity to a transceiver. Now the transceiver may be using the SDR to implement a pan adapter, or maybe the SDR is simply being used as an additional receiver to monitor different bands, but regardless, protection is needed. Now this protection may be included within the transceiver itself and indeed if you're using an output from the transceiver to the uh, SDR that's protected by the transceiver's internal TR switch then no further protection would be required. There are several factors that contribute to how much near field coupling will occur. Obviously transmit power level is one and the frequency of operation. But also the type of antenna in use and the length of the antenna versus the wavelength it's being operated at. And then of course there's antenna separation between the transmit and receive antennas and even the relative geometries of those two antennas. So it can get quite complicated. Luckily there are some online resources available that will help you determine whether near field coupling would be a concern in your particular situation. We'll take a brief look at a few of them but then I want to introduce you to a more empirical approach using your existing equipment to come up with a rough estimate of whether or not you need additional protection for your receiver. This page on ant unwanted antenna coupling from W8JI is a really nice resource that shows you in color coded charts when near field coupling is a problem at different frequency bands and at different power levels. The link for it is shown on the slide and is also included in the YouTube description. I'd also like to refer you to a couple of online calculators that you can use and put in the various parameters to determine what's going on in your vicinity. The first one is from everythingrf.com and the second one is from Roden Schwartz. Again, the links are shown on the slide and will be included in the YouTube description. If you're like me and are averse to doing complicated calculations, you may be wondering if there's some sort of quick and dirty method or some rule of thumb you can use to determine if it's going to be an issue. And indeed there is. And to get there, we're going to use a unique feature in the SDR UNO software of having a built-in calibrated power meter. Now using that, we're going to measure 
the approximate received power levels for a particular setup. And if those received power levels are below the threshold of damage, then no further protection is required. But if we're close to the threshold or indeed above, then we must take additional steps to protect our receiver. To illustrate this approach, I'm going to go through a list of frequently asked questions. And as we go through each of the questions, it will become apparent how we can use these techniques to come up with some estimate as to whether or not we need to take further precautions. First up, let's talk about handy talkies, uh, portable handheld radios. People often ask if that's an issue because you're carrying around a radio with its transmitter close to the SDR itself. Now the short answer is it's relatively low in power and it's really the distance from the receive antenna connected to the SDR and not the uh, SDR receiver box itself that is of most concern. But since I promised you an empirical approach, Let's fire it up and see. Here's my setup. I'm running SDR Uno on a laptop and it's connected to an RSP1A, which in turn is connected to a disc own antenna mounted to my chimney pro approximately 20 feet above. And since we're experimenting, I thought we'd try a few other configurations as well. So in addition to the disc own, I'm gonna just leave the antenna terminal open I'm going to try terminating the antenna input and then finally I'm going to use a telescopic antenna mounted on the desktop and let's see what happens. That's a neat little event that uh, you know we do. Uh... So here we are on the two meter band and for our experiments I need to carefully look and make sure that there's an empty space within the spectrum and then I'll set my handy talkie to that frequency and use it for our experiments. So for the first experiment, I'm going to hold the handy talkie very close to the RSP1 and hit the talk button. And whoa, what's going on there? Here's a still frame, and not surprisingly, we see the overload warning is on. Now the A to D converter will overload long before any damage is caused to the RSP, but what it means is the A to D does not output sensible data anymore, and so a good spectrum cannot be calculated. So what we need to do is make some settings adjustments and try that experiment again. So the first thing I'm going to do is reduce the RF gain to minimum, then open up the settings window, go to the IF AGC and turn that off, and move the IF gain settings down to its minimum value also. Having done that, it's necessary to change the, the way the display appears. So first we need to move the, uh, the bottom level down, and then we will change the scale to bring 0 dBm into view. 0 dBm, remember, is the threshold at which damage may be caused to the RSP if that level is exceeded for any length of time. So now if we repeat the experiment, as long as signal levels remain below 0 dBm, we should be safe. Now once again, I'm going to hold the handy talkie close to the RSP1A and key the mic. Let's see what happens this time. That's much better, and we can see that the peak is below 0 dBm. Let's have a look at a still for more detail. As you can see here, the received power level is minus 18.5 dBm, so comfortably less than the 0 dBm threshold. But in the interest of experimentation, I'm going to repeat this test, but move the handy talkie a little further away. One reason for performing this test is just to find out how much of the signal is being coupled in through the case of the RSP1A versus being picked up by the disc cone antenna up above. The distance to the disc cone hasn't really going to change much, but we are somewhat further away from the RSP1A itself. Let's see what happens. So there it is. Looking at it in detail, it's minus 21.5 dBm, which is somewhat less than the minus 18.5 dBm we measured previously, but most of the signal would appear to be coming in through the disco. So now to complete the experiment, I will move outside, and I'll repeat again holding the handy talkie beneath the disco, but well away from the RSP1A. And there it is, and the signal's not appreciably different than the previous experiment. So we're now measuring minus 21.2 dBm versus minus 21.5. So for completeness, I ran a couple more tests. 
First, I put the handy talkie next to the RSP1A with no antenna connected, and now the uh, received signal level is down to minus 27 dBm, that's the lowest so far, and then I also tried terminating the input. Unfortunately, I didn't have a, an SMA termination handy, but I had a short pigtail with a 75 ohm resistor, which I used instead, and that got us down to minus 31 dBm. So basically, uh, very little is actually coupled through the case of the device. Uh, most of the signal comes in from the antenna itself, or perhaps partly through the feed line connected to the antenna. So far, everything's been looking pretty good. So is there a scenario where a handy talkie could damage the RSP1A? Well, in my quest for knowledge, I thought I'd try a telescopic tabletop antenna connected directly to the RSP1A. As you can see from the plot though, it still wasn't a very strong signal that came through. Operating the handy talkie some 8 to 10 feet away, I was still only receiving minus 21.3 dBm. So instead, I went right on top of the RSP1A again. But now, I actually did read a positive number, 2.9 dBm, which does exceed the 0 dBm threshold. So you wouldn't want to be transmitting right on top of the RSP1A for any length of time. I know I've spent quite a lot of time talking about VHF radios, but that was intentional. With the 2 meter wavelength, it makes it relatively easy to achieve the necessary separation to prevent near field coupling, while still being able to illustrate the basic concepts. But now I'm going to change gears and let's talk about HF a little bit. What happens if your RSP is bolted right next to your rig? Well, as you can see from this picture, I guess it's not too adverse. This is my RSP1A bolted next to a Kenwood TS590SG I often use for demonstration purposes at various ham shows. It's worth repeating that what we really worry about is the coupling from the antenna, the transmitting antenna, to the receive antenna. So unless there's something terribly wrong with your ring or the feed line to going up to the antenna, this should not be an issue. But what can be a real issue are the laws of physics. If you remember the online chart I showed earlier with the red areas depending on uh, wavelength and transmitted power, HF having a much longer wavelength makes it much more difficult to achieve a satisfactory separation to prevent near-field coupling from occurring. So the approach we're going to take is similar to what we did with the handheld. We're going to utilize the built-in power meter in SDR Uno. We'll set the RF gain to a minimum as well as the IF gain and then we'll adjust the scale on SP1 to show that 0 dBm level. But now, instead of adjusting spatial separation, we're going to change the transmit power levels and see whether or not we may have an issue. So again, the goal is to achieve less than 0 dBm continuous, or less than plus 10 dBm for short periods. If the signal is below those levels, then no further protection is required, otherwise steps will need to be taken to protect the RSP, unless of course you're feeding it from a protected output on your transceiver. If you made it up to 100 watts of transmitted power, or whatever the maximum you're trying to operate at, without seeing a signal level above 0 dBm, then congratulations, no more work is required. But if the signal starts getting pretty high, what steps must we take to protect the RSP? Let's have a look at some options. We often recommend an external TR switch, such as the MFJ1708B-SDR, for situations when a common antenna is shared between the rig and the RSP. But you can also use such a switch for a separate dedicated receive antenna, but you will need to provide a control line from your rig to operate the switch during transmit. If your RSP has multiple inputs, you can use multiple TR switches to protect them all. Alternatively, you may elect to use a, a manual antenna switch to select which of the inputs on the RSP is the one being protected. Other options include some sort of RF limiter. The RG5000, Receive Guard 5000 from DX Engineering is a popular choice, or a good old-fashioned manual antenna switch, as I just mentioned. However, if using a manual switch, you have to be 100% certain that you remember to deactivate the signal to your RSP before you transmit. Okay, before we wrap this up, let's go through the remaining frequently asked questions. 
people sometimes ask if it's adequate to power down the RSP or disconnect the USB cable and will that provide adequate protection? And the answer to that is a definite no. The key thing here is how much power comes into the antenna input terminal and that is what causes the input protection diodes to be destroyed. In fact, when the device is powered down, in the absence of any bias to the device, it makes it slightly more susceptible to damage. The only way to guarantee true protection is to disconnect the antenna input under transmit conditions or when near field coupling can be expected to occur. Nor is it any help if you tune the RSP to a frequency a long way away from the transmitting frequency. Again, it's just a total power arriving in through the antenna terminal that has the potential to cause damage. You'll sometimes hear people talking about maintaining half a wavelength of separation between the antennas. Um, that is sometimes true, but not always. If you refer to the uh, references cited earlier, uh, it depends on whether we're talking about a short antenna or a long antenna with respect to the uh, transmitted frequency. So uh, again, it is a rule of thumb, but it's not a 100% rule of thumb. So my recommendation is to use the calculators or the tables referenced earlier and then confirm that using some of the empirical techniques we've covered in this video. So in summary, the RSPs are no more susceptible to damage than any other sensitive radio receiver. It's just that SDRs tend to get used in an environment where near field coupling or exposure to other transmitted fields are highly likely. Consequently, when being used close to a transmitting antenna, steps must be taken to ensure that serious or dangerous overloads do not occur, and if necessary, external protection circuitry must be added to prevent damage. As always, thank you very much for watching, and we hope you found some of this information useful. For this and additional information, feel free to visit our website, in particular the downloads, the help, and the support catalogues all contain a wealth of information to help you get the most out of your RSP. 73.